Well, we hope that uh, if you've come in this morning after our first session that you won't be lost by what we're about to say because we're continuing some of our thinking from our first lesson this morning about the life and character and the nature of faith which was possessed by the Old Testament character Abraham. The concept of faith, I think, well, it's central to our faith, isn't it? I mean, we have to know what faith is in order to have it. And how much preaching has been done through the years about faith? How much singing have we done, Tim, about faith? How much thought have we given to faith as we've considered uh, what it means to walk by faith and what it means to do what God would have us to do? I mean, the people around us who don't have faith are people who are usually looking at us and saying, you know, you believe in a God you can't see, and you claim to be trusting in a God that you've never heard Him speak a word to you, and you're looking toward a future that to us is just absolutely unpredictable and uncertain, but every one of those things are pivotal concepts in our relationship with the God of heaven, aren't they? They're things that we have to do. There's a lot that's been written through the years. Probably, I don't know of any other subject about which more has been written by authors than the subject of faith. Go to a bookstore anywhere you want to go or get online and look at the books that are available on Amazon or whatever and Everybody seems to want to write continually about the matter of faith. One fellow said that faith grows only in the dark. That you've got to trust Him when you can't trace Him. And that's faith. Another fellow defined faith as saying that it is believing in advance in something that will only seem logical to us when we view it in reverse. Maybe that's good. Faith is the bird that sings when the dawn is still dark, a fellow once wrote. And in a more humorous vein, a guy named J.G. Stipe said this. He said, faith is like a toothbrush. Every man should have one. Every man should use it regularly, but he should never try to use somebody else's. And I think that's probably as good a statement as I've ever read or heard about faith. You've got to have your own faith, not somebody else's toothbrush, if you're going to serve God acceptably and do what needs to be done. There's nobody in here this morning who's ever been to a Bible class or heard any preaching much at all, but what you could not for yourself quote the 11th chapter of Hebrews in verse 1, where the Scriptures say that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. If I were to ask... uh, you to describe the life of the Bible character Abraham in one word, I hope that you would say, well, from what we've studied this morning, that one word would have to be, he lived a life of faith. In fact, that is exactly how Abraham was described by the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 9 when he said, So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. And the Hebrew writer spoke about Abraham's faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8 when he said, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? To go somewhere, but to not know where you're actually going. I'm going to be talking to you this morning about the call of Abraham, how all of this got started in his life, this business of listening to God, this business of walking by faith, this business of doing what God called on him to do. His faith is described in Hebrews 11 and verse 8, as we've just read, as a faith that caused him to go without knowing where he was actually going to end up. And there are many people who have read Genesis who come to what I believe is a mistaken conclusion that Abraham's call begins in the first few verses of Genesis chapter 12. Take your Bible and hold your finger at it and we'll read together Genesis chapter 12. Let's look at the first four verses because I think uh, that's pretty important material. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, Genesis 12, 1, and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. 
And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from uh, Haran. When I look at that, I think that we need to recognize that we're reading something pretty important in those verses. For instance, he says that Abram was 75 years old when he departed from where? Haran. Now we in the last hour talked about Abram's experiences in a place called Ur. And what that immediately presents for us is a little bit of a problem because elsewhere there are passages that tell us that Abram was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, which is a city about 600 miles away from uh, Haran. So let me just sort of geographically get our bearings for us this morning. This map uh, pretty well represents uh, what we think of today as most of the Middle East. And of course you can see Haran up there in the top under that big word Hurrians, and then you see to the right of that uh, Nineveh, and uh, below that Babylonia, and under Sumer down there is Ur. And uh, so we have Abram departing at the age of 75 from the city of Haran, but he had spent his life down in Ur. For those who are kind of interested in knowing about this part of the world, this little map surely helps us a little bit, doesn't it? You can watch the nightly news with this map and know where all of these places actually are because Haran is right there on the border of the nation of Syria as we now know it. And of course, if you were to speak of Abraham's uh, ancestry, uh, Abraham is an Iraqi, is he not? He really grew up in the land that we know of as Iraq. And we've had quite a long experience in Iraq, we Americans. We know that part of the world better perhaps than many parts of the world that we've had troops that have served our country's interests in. So it's pretty important to recognize that he left Haran and came into the land of Canaan when he was 75 years old. But here's the problem. If you go to Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 7, it says, You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out from Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. Then, of course, if you look at Stephen's sermon that he preached to the Jewish Sanhedrin in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, Leave your country and your relatives, and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans, and settled in Haran. And from there, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are now living. Now Stephen is pretty plain, isn't he? And what it appears is that what Stephen is saying is in contradiction to what we are looking at over in Genesis chapter 12, and of course, as usual, at this point, those who are skeptical of Scripture and want to discredit the Word of God immediately will just sort of slam their Bibles shut and say, well, see there, you, you can't depend on the Bible getting its facts straight, and one fellow will tell you one thing and another guy will tell you something else. But as is true with all of the so-called contradictions of Scripture, a little bit of familiarity, a little bit of study of the Scriptures usually resolves that issue. Here's what I want you to consider. I want you to consider the possibility that there may have very well been two different calls of Abraham. One call came to Abraham when he was in his home city of Ur of the Chaldees, and then the other one came at the age of 75 after he had been living for a while in Haran and after his father Terah had actually passed away. You will remember that we have already seen that Abram was not really given the exact destination when he left Ur. And so it's reasonable for us to uh, conclude that there may have been several guidance or reassurance calls that God 
would have made to Abraham that we might not even really even be aware of that were designed to move him along the track to where God eventually wanted him to be. In fact, may I just suggest to you that if you look closely at the story of Abraham, the Bible indicates that God communicated with Abraham at least six different times in his life. Now, I think most of us probably operate with the idea that they got up and had breakfast together every morning, and God talked to him today about what's going to go on today and what's going to go on next week. And I think many of us mistakenly think that there was a time when God just talked to everybody and that God had conversations with Noah and Daniel and David and Samuel and Abraham and all these Old Testament characters just like uh, they were in a uh, uh, relationship with one another as friends that uh, would involve them picking up the phone every day and just checking in to see how things were going on. But I'm here to tell you, I don't think at all that there has ever been a time when God just went around talking to people all the time. The Scriptures only record six different occasions when God is said to have communicated with Abraham, not just at the beginning. So the idea of God communicating with Abraham multiple times is certainly reasonable. He did speak to him in Ur of the Chaldees, according to Acts 7 and verse 2. He did speak to him in Haran in Genesis chapter 12. He'll speak to him again in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7 when he is at Moreh in Canaan. And then he will speak to him in chapter 15 when Abram is at the Oaks of Mamre near Hebron. And then he'll speak to him again in chapter 17 when Abram is at Mamre. He will speak to him in chapter 22 when he is at Mount Moriah in the process of offering up his son Isaac on the altar. And of course there could be others. I would not say God never talked to him except those times. But we only have six different occasions in which God actually is recorded to have spoken to him. So what I have concluded, and you don't have to agree with this, but what I have concluded is that this call that we're reading about in Genesis chapter 12 is most likely a second call from God and not a contradiction of other passages of the Scriptures. And so for our purposes this morning, we're really only going to be talking about this initial call. Now back up to verse uh, 27, I guess we would say, of chapter 11. And I think as we do that and we read down through, we'll find where these calls occur. Look at verse 27. These are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan, and they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So that's a lot of information really for us to uh, synthesize and to get into our heads. But let me just mention some things that I think we need to know about all of that. We know that Abram received this first call in Ur of the Chaldees, just as the Bible says in various places. What I think we can learn from that one call when he first received a call from God in Ur, some things about Abraham's faith that we need to know. And what I want you to do this morning as we make these observations is I want you to compare these things that Abram was called upon to do by God with the quality of your faith. In other words, put yourself in Abram's boots and decide how you would react if you had received the same sort of call that Abram received to leave his country and to go to a land that God says, I will show you. Now we saw in Hebrews 11, 8, where we began this morning, that Abraham's faith was shown because in obedience he went out not knowing where he was going. 
Now that in and of itself is interesting. You get in the car to go someplace, generally you have a destination. And we have uh, GPS systems, and on our phones now we have all of this guidance that allows us to get from point A to point B, sometimes to places we've never seen, some places we've never ever been before, and we just follow some satellite's directions and we get exactly where we're going. But when we set out, we knew where we were going. I remember when I was just a boy, my granddaddy lived about uh, two miles away from us, and he would come over to our farm there in North Alabama and he would get me, I was probably about five, maybe six years old, and put me in his car and my mother would say, well, where are you all going? And he would say, I don't know. I'll know when I get there. Sometimes he would say, in my granddaddy's parlance, he would say, Chattanooga, he'd say. He had this idea that you could go to Chattanooga, Tennessee, I guess, uh, for the day. I don't know that he ever did that in his life, but that was just some of the things he ever would express. And, and so he was about the only fellow I've ever known that just got in the car and went someplace and had no idea where he was going to end up. And he certainly couldn't tell my mom where we were going. And in those days, if she would needed to find us, there would have been no way to do it. But the fact of the matter is, we usually know where we're going when we leave home. But God did not initially show Abraham where He wanted him to go. The order from God to disembark and to go came with very little explanation. And so may I suggest to you that when we're thinking about Abraham's faith, we need to recognize that the call of faith always involves a certain degree of uncertainty. And every person I'm looking at here this morning who is a baptized believer, a Christian, is somebody who has embarked on a life of faith and there are some things about your life that you don't have answers to and there are some things happening to you and some places that you're going that you've never been and you don't know exactly how it's going to turn out and you don't know what the final destination might necessarily be for you, but you are following every day what God has called upon you to do. God did not tell Abram where he was going. All he had to go on was a command to leave his home from a God that he had little experience even knowing. And he got the promise that I'll show you as we go where you've got to be. I have often heard, and I alluded to this just a few moments ago, I've often heard Christians, well-meaning Christians, say things like, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have lived back in the days when God spoke directly to people and told them what He wanted them to do, and they didn't have to wonder whether or not what they were doing was within the will of God or not. I've had Christians frustrated because they'll tell me that they want to know God's will and I'll tell them, well, what do you find in Scripture? And They don't want to dig into a book and read and try to learn from somebody else's experiences like Abraham's about what they are to do. And I think a lot of us may have operated with the faulty conclusion that it must have been easy to have had faith in God in an era of time when God actually spoke audibly and that people could converse or at least they could listen with their ear to what the voice of God was actually telling them. Now setting aside the obvious issue that God never has spoken to everyone directly in any period of Bible history, I want you to consider just for a moment how much information Abraham was given before he obeyed and left Ur. If Stephen's record in Acts chapter 7 is complete, he had exactly one sentence. And that's all he had. He had one verse, Depart from your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. That's not much information. Beyond that, the implied answer was, Now you just got to trust me on this. You've got to do what I'm asking you to do because I'm your God. And I'm telling you this is the path that you've got to take. I'll give you more information as time goes along, but this is what you must do right now. Why are we not more certain about what God wants us to be doing? Why are we not more faithful than Abraham? Well, 
I think one of the reasons for that is, is that many of us have spent very little time learning what the Scriptures have to say. Oh yes, we show up at church, and oh yes, we listen politely when a teacher teaches, but to get in there and actually read the Scriptures for ourselves and to dig through all of the information that they contain and to learn what this means to me, I am here to make an accusation which I cannot prove. But it just seems to me that we are living in a time where there is more widespread ignorance of the Bible than at any other time in our nation's history. And I can only speak of our nation. I've never lived, nor have I been a citizen anywhere else. I'm not just referring to the ignorance among those who don't even try to follow God. I am referring to ignorance among our brethren about Scripture. It is scary, actually. It is frightening to me to think about what we do not know. But if you're going to have faith, you've got to understand what your faith must be in. Because otherwise your faith will be misplaced. And you have to have faith to serve God. But even with a good knowledge of the Bible that gives us a maximum faith potential, faith is still a challenge. Why? Because it always involves a level of uncertainty an element of having to go without knowing, in the words of the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 11 and verse 8. My friends, obeying God, when there does not appear to be any tangible assurance of the outcome other than the fact that God has promised one, takes a lot of determination. It takes a great deal of commitment. It always has been tough to do that, it will continue to be tough as long as we live until we reach glory. Faith is always wrapped up in an element of uncertainty because we're putting our trust in someone else other than ourselves. May I suggest to you that when it comes to the nature of Abraham's faith, the call of faith is not always the most convenient call that we will answer. I want you to just think about that little six-letter word command, depart. You got the word to depart, wherever it is that you live nowadays. Would that one little word cause any upset in your life? Would there be any changes that would have to be made that some of them you don't see any sense in making? I know a number of years ago I was going to move from one place to another to work and One of my children, one of my daughters, came to me and said, Daddy, are you mad at the church? And I said, no, ma'am. He said, well, are the elders mad at you? I said, no, we're very good friends, in fact. And she said, and we're going to move over to such and such a place and do such and such work? This is the dumbest thing we've ever done, she said. (laughs) And I don't know how to argue with that. I mean, there's just absolutely no way to argue with the wisdom, sometimes it comes out of a child's mouth. And I will tell you that that word depart was not a very convenient word. Here is Abraham who had to uproot whatever business he was in. I don't know what he did for a living. He had to uproot his family. He probably had to sell some holdings that he, he, you know, he couldn't go by the Wells Fargo Bank, get a cashier's check. Stuff that in his saddlebags and ride off and make a deposit when he got to the next town. He couldn't wire any money anywhere. He had to sell whatever he had and liquidate whatever assets he had in order to take that with him. He had to endure all of the questions. You know, knowing human nature as we do, you know that there were a lot of people that were looking at Abraham kind of like my daughter did and they're wanting to know, you're going to do what? Abraham, you have always lived here. Your people, as long as we've had people, they've lived here. Our people have always done what you're doing. We've never thought about going someplace else. In fact, look at how good we have it here in Ur. Why would anybody want to go anywhere else? Why would anybody want to live any other place than where we are living? You can't even see this God that you claim has been calling on you to move. We don't know this God. None of your relatives serve Him. We've lived here always. And I'm sure that those kinds of questions probably bore down pretty heavily on Abram as he was thinking about what am I going to do. But the risk that Abraham 
was taking in departing was very, very real because he was going to have to go to a place where there would probably be some pretty strange people. Who could know what kind of dangers he might face even getting there? When he left home, would there be highway robbers that would be lying in wait along whatever route God chose for him? To add to this, those that went with him also had to endure all the inconvenience and risk. You talk about Abraham and Sarah and their relationship. I wonder how she took this news. Well, Sarah, we're going to leave her. Well, okay, we can go over to the next village for a day or two if you want to do that. No, no, I don't mean take a vacation, which was unheard of. But he said, I mean, we're going to move. Move. And where are we going, Abram? I don't know. God hasn't told me. She's taking his temperature already. She's wanting to know what's wrong with my husband. She's calling the doctor. She's trying to figure out what's going on with this man. Is he having a midlife crisis? She doesn't understand what it is that's compelling him to do the things that he's going to do. And I am telling you that they knew very little, I'm sure, of the compulsion that drove Abraham. Surely there must have been some searching questions. Now what does that mean to me? What does that mean to you? I'll tell you what it means to me. I must expect that if I'm going to be a person of faith, that that's not going to be easy at times. Sometimes it's going to be very, very difficult. And faith has never, ever been easy. It will always challenge the status quo. There will be times when following God and obedience will mean that I will be inconvenienced. It will mean sometimes that people around me will not understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. People will think I'm crazy. I'm sure there were people that thought Abraham had a few screws loose, that he needed some help some way or the other. But I want you to listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. He said, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. I'm telling you that your faith can sometimes be a fiery ordeal in your life and to a generation that sometimes considers it just an ordeal to get up out of bed and get to church on Sunday morning. Walking by faith is a real significant challenge. And we learn that when we study the life of this man. But I will tell you that thirdly, we also see that the call of faith has to be stronger than any of our family ties. Look at Acts 7 and verse 3 once more, where the Scripture said, Depart from your country and your relatives. That's what God said to him. Depart from your country and your relatives. Abraham was to leave his relatives behind in earth. My guess as to the reason for that is that they were probably all idol worshipers. And he did not need to be overwhelmed with the number of idol worshipers coming along with him. You know the ruins of Ur that we looked at a few moments ago and some pictures Uh, show that the city was full of idols, especially of that one related to the worship of the moon, the patron god of Ur. And Tira, of course, as we pointed out, was in fact an idol worshiper according to what Joshua said in Joshua 24 and verse 2. And you know, to me, if you stop and think about this, it brings up a pretty interesting point. Maybe you've thought about it. If Abraham was supposed to depart from his relatives, why did he take his father Tira with him? In fact, as you read that, it appears in verse 31 of chapter 11 that Terah took Abraham. And not that Abraham took Terah at all. Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran, and they settled there. Now probably the reason it appears that Terah took Abram and not that Abram took Terah is because the writer of the book of Genesis is reporting on the records of the generation of Terah. He's talking about what Terah did in verse 27 there of chapter 11. And he's not really telling the story of Abraham yet till he gets to chapter 12. And so he's telling it from Terah's perspective. 
As for why Abram took his father and why he took his wife and also his nephew, some people say that, believe it or not, that Abraham took them with him because though he did obey God by getting out of his country, that his faith wasn't strong enough to fully obey God's command and leave all of his relatives behind. In other words, he obeyed, but he obeyed partially. I don't subscribe to that view, but it is a common expression of explanation as to why the words appear to be what they are here. But what I have said to you could be the case, but before we reach that conclusion, we need to look again at what Stephen said and what Stephen did not say when he told of that original call. Remember, he said, Depart from your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. There is no mention specifically of leaving his father, per se, in that original call. But wouldn't his father be included in that term relatives? Well, not necessarily, because if we look at Abraham's second call, the one out of Haran in Genesis 12, 1, we find a specific mention of his father there in addition to the mention of his relatives in Genesis 12 and verse 1. So if the word relatives included his father, then why make the additional mention of his father? Well, I conclude that the word relatives in the original call may not have included a prohibition on taking his father along. It may have meant what we would call today, just leave your extended family home. Not those nearest you, not your father for whom you may have some responsibility, certainly not your wife to whom you're married, and then they'd inherited this nephew because of his brother's death, and so those that Abraham had primary responsibility for would be included in those that should go. You think about their lifespan. Terah lived to be 205 years old. Abraham lived to be 175 years old. How much extended family would you accumulate if you lived that long? You'd have a lot of relatives. You'd have a lot of grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, even great-great-great-grandchildren. You would have all kinds of brothers-in-law and aunts and uncles and all kinds of people that you would have accumulated in that long life. But if you look back earlier to that statement about the call of faith, you will find that God intended for Abraham to recognize that following Him was to be stronger than any of the ties that you've made to your family. And did not Jesus teach us that? One of the most inconvenient truths, actually, of being a child of God is that Jesus taught us in Matthew 10, 37, that he who loves his father or his mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Does this mean that Jesus is anti-family? There would be some that would say that. But some of the strongest teaching about family loyalty anywhere is found in Scripture. You find the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8 saying that if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I believe being a Christian will make a better son of you. Being a Christian will make a better daughter of you. It will make a better husband, a better father, a better wife, a better grandparent. Being a Christian will make anybody better than what they are. But when you compare what you are as a Christian and your dedication to Him, to your family, your faith in God must be stronger than the ties you have to your kin. And if it all comes down one day to a choice between God's will and my family's will, faith means that I must choose God. There are a couple of scenarios I can think of immediately this morning where that might be the case. I may be speaking this morning to somebody whose people, your family, might have raised you in a certain religion that you came to learn at some point in time was not what God taught in Scripture those serving Him should practice. And at that point, if you can't get your relatives to change, or if you can't get your relatives to obey God, you have to make a decision about whether you're going to stay in falsehood with your relatives or follow the call of God into truth. I just don't know how many, but I'm sure there were maybe most of our ancestors as Christians in the first century who faced that decision about their Jewish roots when they accepted Jesus as Messiah and other family members didn't. What do you think that did to their family? What do you think 
that did to the relationship that they had with one another. We cannot be people of faith and cling to falsehood because that's what our families have always believed. We must do what God calls upon us to do. Another possible example of God over family, sometimes people who've been in the church for years may tend to give special preference to their family members and they may sometimes make exception to clearly taught truths in regard to their families. I've seen situations in the church where leaders were intensely diligent about doing what was right and making sure that other people did that. And they are death on anybody that would disregard God's commandments until it comes down to a member of their family. And then they make exceptions. Rather than saying we must obey God rather than men, we must follow the Lord rather than our family. And I'm saying to us this morning that the call of faith must be stronger than our family ties. I mentioned Big Ben to you. Do you know what that is? You know what the Big Ben is in London? You know what the Eiffel Tower is? Of course, we know what the Statue of Liberty is in New York Harbor. The Statue of Lord Nelson in Trafalgar Square in London. What do all those things have in common? Well, let me tell you about one thing they have in common. In the 1920s, there was a certain Scotsman by the name of Arthur Ferguson who sold every one of those things to unsuspecting buyers. He used his uh, amazing sales ability to extract $30,000 from a well-to-do American for Nelson statue. He got $5,000 from another American for Big Ben And by the time the law caught up with Ferguson and he was sent to prison, he had not only sold the landmarks that I had just mentioned to somebody, but he had taken $10,000 as a down payment on Buckingham Palace. And people bought it and thought that they had the rights to it as a result of this transaction that they had made with him. Now I want you to tell me, what is wrong with Mr. Ferguson's transactions? The same thing that is wrong with many people's faith today. He was dealing in something he did not possess. He was dealing in something that belonged to somebody else, that he had real no rights to at all. Anybody can claim to have faith, but the true test is not words. It is the life that stands up to the challenges that faith brings. And faith, my friends, is going without knowing. And we see that exemplified in the life of Abraham where his faith took him into some uncertain areas and some inconveniences and to some difficulties with his family. What's the state of your faith this morning? Are you where Abraham was? Let me say to all of us that if we're where Abraham was as people of faith, we're all in this same circumstance where faith sometimes is uncertain, where it's not convenient, and where we have to choose God over other people. And I hope that the things we say this morning about Him will be useful to you and help you to walk more closely with the Lord by faith. Thank you so very much for your kind attention. You've just been a very good group to preach to this morning, and I look forward to the next hour together.